This seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for our Healthy You webinar series. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to enter any questions you may have using the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted once the presentation concludes. Your, con questions, will, your questions will remain anonymous. Today's presenter is Mohammed Bilal, and he will be discussing interventional radiology's role in managing chronic female pelvic pain. Dr. Bilal is the Medical Director of Vascular and Interventional Radiology at Mather Hospital since 2011. He is also the Program Director for the Integrated Interventional Radiology Residency Program at Mather Hospital. He has been on the medical staff since 2004 and is the Senior Interventional Radiologist within the Imaging Services Department. Upon earning his medical degree from the School of Medicine at Boston University, Dr. Bilal completed a residency in diagnostic radiology at Long Island Jewish Medical Center in New Hyde Park, New York. During his residency, he was the junior and senior chief resident. He concluded his training with a fellowship in vascular and interventional radiology at Long Island Jewish Medical Center in 2004. Dr. Bilal is certified by the American Board of Diagnostic Radiology and specializes in all aspects of diagnostic and interventional radiology with particular expertise and, on, and oncologic interventions, women's health, and spine intervention. Dr. Bilal? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the introduction. The topic we're gonna to talk about today is the role of interventional radiology in managing chronic pelvic pain in women. And this is a topic that I've spent a lot of time both in my training years, as well as out in the community and find that many, many women in our local communities are not aware of some of the options when it comes to dealing with chronic pelvic pain. A lot of these visits end up with office visits to their gynecologist, taking up to 40% of most outpatient visits, primarily affects childbearing age women, and oftentimes can lead to a high number of hysterectomies and or diagnostic laparotomies, which sometimes are not uh, yielding to either answers or resolving in their pain following these procedures. So what I'd like to focus on are two particular topics. One is uterine fibroids and pelvic congestion syndrome, which is also known as pelvic venous insufficiency. And we'll go over both of those in somewhat detail. Uterine fibroids, these are considered to be benign tumors of the uterus. And oftentimes, uh, one out of every five females may be affected. And what's known about these is that they can also be hormonally dependent, oftentimes growing as women go through their cycles or pregnancies. Um, and in a rare situation, one out of 1,000 can turn into a malignant lesion, which is why they often need to be followed and monitored carefully uh, over time. These oftentimes can be diagnosed by ultrasound, which can be done in the GYN's office or as an outpatient. Uh, sometimes we will work them, work up the patients by doing pelvic MRI studies with IV contrast or intravenous contrast. Sometimes we'll do other additional studies which result in dye injection into the canal to evaluate for the source of symptoms or bleeding, which is often a common complaint. Next slide. And with regards to where fibroids can be located, uh, we can have fibroids located in various sections of the uterus, both in the lower portion, in the muscle, jutting into the canal, underneath the lining, and they can lead to a whole host of symptoms. For example, heavy bleeding, heavy cycles, painful cycles, other symptoms of bloating and cramping. Sometimes they lead to constipation or hemorrhoids, 
bladder frequency because of the way the uterus sits on the bladder. And then because of the size of the uterus, it may also lead to back pain or leg pain as it pushes on nerves. And oftentimes it can also lead to infertility and affecting uh, future uh, childbearing. Many times these are handled by going with uh, anti-inflammatory over-the-counter medications. Sometimes the bleeding is controlled with hormonal control where by using oral contraception or perhaps an IUD can help to reduce the size of the blood vessels inside the fibroids and that can also help to manage the symptoms. Some of the symptoms can also be due to anemia, due to chronic heavy loss, and patients may end up requiring transfusions of iron or blood, or even being on oral supplements with iron. The surgical options typically are either a hysteroscopic uh, resection, meaning a uh, going in into the uterus through the scope and removing a small uh, fibroid there, or it may also be through a myomectomy, which is can be done either as an open procedure or laparoscopic. Um, and a hysterectomy, which is the um, uh, removal of the uterus. And again, that could be done as a partial hysterectomy or may be done as a total laparoscopic hysterectomy. Next slide. So some of the options that we can that are out there with regards to what are available to manage a symptomatic fibroid are things like the uterine fibroid embolization procedure, which I'll review, uh, thermal ablation, which may be a procedure where they can heat the lining of the uterus in order to help um, cauterize the vessels and the surface and perhaps some of the tissue. Uh, such as adenomyosis, which can result in uh, heavy bleeding. Uh, the MRI can also, sorry, just one last one on the last one. Uh, MRI HIFU is where MR can be used to guide high frequency ultrasound into the fibroid and be used as a means to help uh, heat up and coagulate the tissue. So sim simply speaking, one of the things when we talk about a fibroid embolization procedure, the essence of it really is, is that uterine fibroids are tissues that are living and have very, very robust blood vessels. And these robust blood vessels feed the fibroid. And the procedure itself involves identifying the source of blood that comes into the uterus tissue, which is usually the uterine artery, Sometimes we can also have patients who have arteries that feed their ovary, coming from a different location, feeds the ovary, and then also is a dominant player with regards to feeding the fibroid. This occurs probably in about five to 10 patients. The procedure typically involves going in through an artery such as in the groin or perhaps even in the wrist, which is not depicted here, but that is an alternative route. Um, where once we are inside the artery, we basically pass a small tube on, on x-ray into the main blood vessel feeding the uterus called the uterus artery and identify that and essentially take away the blood supply here at the uterus level. Next slide. And the way that this is done is we want to be able to take away small branch blood vessels that feed tissue and when we inject these small gelatinous beads, which are of various sizes, the, the uh, embolic agent in this case is injected through the catheter and then sort of like looking at a tree where you have the catheter sitting in the main portion of that trunk and releasing the beads where the blood flow carries it inside the tissue bed. And because fibroids have a very rich blood supply, the majority of these beads concentrate inside the fibroid tissue, leading to an intense degree of starvation of this particular tissue, leading to it to be uh, undergoing tissue death. Now, typically these are procedures that are performed 
in the hospital, but can be also done in an outpatient setting, depending on the setup. Here at Mather, we typically have these procedures done with same day or an overnight stay observation. Uh, the purpose of staying overnight really is to help manage the degree of pelvic cramps that may occur from tissue. Remember that the uterus and the fibroids are composed of smooth muscle. And so oftentimes the initial cramps that may, that may uh, initiate from the procedure uh, may require more management with uh, different types of pain medications that perhaps the patient may not be able to tolerate on the outpatient side at home. Uh, we typically would give moderate sedation, so this is not done under general anesthesia. Uh, moderate sedation is sort of a combination of medications where our patients are awake if we are talking to them or stimulating them, but at the same time, if we did not stimulate them or talk to them, they can be sleeping and then also be able to maintain their own airway as they're breathing, and that's, that's why it's called moderate conscious sedation. Um, but typically, we give you know uh, uh, intravenous anti-inflammatory agents like Motrin, antibiotics, things for nausea. Um, and so the you don't really need a medical clearance because we don't involve anesthesia for this. So having the patient present for the procedure can be a very quick turnaround. So just to kind of go over some examples of what this may look like. Uh, on your left-hand side of the screen here, we have an MRI image of a female pelvis. Towards the back here is the spine, and you have the bladder here, and you can see that this is the fibroid uterus, this entire structure. These areas with the dark rounded structures, these are big bulky fibroids, and because the uterus is so bulky, it's pushing on the uterus on the uh, bladder, compressing it, leading to bladder frequency. It can also push upon the spine, leading to back pain. The size of the uterus also distends the anterior abdominal wall, which can give that sense of bloating and fullness. And because these fibroids are related to the lining, so in the middle image here, we're looking at somebody square on in the mirror. And this person has multiple fibroids. They are related to the uterus lining. And because these are all heavily, richly blood supplied, they result in heavy menses or heavy cycles. And when we, in, when we order an MRI for a patient to be uh, evaluated for the possibility of being a candidate for this procedure, one of the things that we're looking for is how much of the fibroid is living tissue. And if something is totally living, it, there's a better chance of it to undergo starvation and a better chance for it to undergo shrinkage and therefore have better outcome with their symptoms. So in other words, it's basically establishing candidacy and predicting what, what level of impact the procedure may have on the symptoms for the patient. So in this last picture here on the right side, this is again looking at a patient with an MRI that demonstrates multiple fibroids. And because the dye was injected, we could see all the blood vessels lighting up. And also we see that the tissue centrally is lighting up as well. So these are, these are uh, fibroids that are pretty much near 100% living tissue. And so this patient may undergo a pretty good degree of tissue death and shrinkage of these fibroids. Just to kind of show you examples, uh, when we are in the procedure injecting dye and identifying blood vessels, uh, here we are coming in from the groin on this side, and the catheter has moved on to the other side on the left side of the patient at the groin. We are identifying the uterus artery, which is here. And when we inject the dye, we can actually see very nicely all the big vessels that highlight the fibroids. And these, these vessels are abnormally enlarged. And as we go through the scene, we can again appreciate all the degrees of prominent blood vessels that are feeding into the fibroids. And similarly, on the other side, when we go from the right side and look, we also appreciate enlarged blood vessels. And same thing, lots of blood vessels. And so this picture and this picture, when we put it together, adds to the entire appearance of the uterus, which helps us to understand that 
the uterus is being supplied by right and left uterus arteries, and that we're not as concerned about the possibility of an ovary artery, which, which would be a different source. So it's always important for us to identify the potential source of the uh, blood supply to the uterus to help us understand how to perform the procedure. Now, in a patient here, this is an alternative situation where, again, we don't see the tissue lighting up, particularly from the uterus artery, which is being injected right here on this image. However, what we do notice is that there is communication from the uterus artery into the ovary artery, as depicted on the middle slide. And also on your right-hand slide, this also communicates with the right ovary. And so it's, it's a matter of some basic plumbing. We have to understand both sources of blood flow so that if we're going to create starvation somewhere, we want to make sure that we are able to address and potentially treat all sources of blood flow coming inside the uterus, whether it's from the uterus artery or from the ovary artery. Next slide. Now, following the procedure, it is not uncommon to undergo what is called a post-embolic syndrome, which usually manifests itself as a low-grade temperature, fatigue, body aches, nausea. Some of these symptoms may sound awfully familiar in this current time frame that we're in, um, but also additionally cringe. And this, these, this syndrome typically can last anywhere between uh, up to uh, seven to 10 days, roughly. However, the first 24 to 48 hours are typically where we may need to address pain management using a PCA pump or intravenous anti-inflammatory agents and antibiotics. But typically by day three, day four, most patients are able to ambulate, walk around, do some light activity. There are no major cuts, incisions, just puncture marks depending on where the procedure was done from, whether it's in the groin or from the wrist on your left hand. Um, so the recovery uh, process can be very short. We typically try to do it from the wrist if we can, called the radial artery. Uh, this allows for ambulation and return to function sooner uh, because we're not dealing with a bigger blood vessel puncture in the groin, which can sometimes delay the recovery process. Next slide. We often see our patients in consultation. If somebody is referred to us, we will order our own MRIs or pelvic ultrasounds, interact with your potentially your referring gynecologist to make sure you had your up-to-date pep smear, any biopsies if they were needed to be done. And once we are done with the procedure, we'll always follow up with you in the office about a week or so afterwards, and then also follow up an MRI in about three to four months. Fibroids typically take about four to four to eight weeks to die and shrink. So the first two months are really more about the evolution of the fibroid. And then once it settles down at around three to four months time, we now can look for a stable visualization of what the outcome of the procedure looks like and how much difference has made both in the appearance, but also in the clinical presentation of the patient in terms of what their symptoms were from the beginning and what impact it has made. So these are the same patient that we had shown prior. The top two slides are perhaps familiar. We went over these uh, on both sides of the screen on the top row. These are two fibroids. One image shows the picture uh, uh, without the contrast being injected, and the other one is after we inject a contrast. And if you look at the two images on the bottom of the screen, you can see that on the right-hand side of the screen on the bottom, the rest of the uterus has lit up, but the fibroids are not. And the overall volume of the uterus has shrunk as well. Uh, and so these are sort of the changes that we're looking for. On the other slide here at the bottom, we see that the fibroids here, two of them or three, four of them have, don't show any enhancement as we refer to it, but that this fibroid here is partially degraded. Uh, and perhaps is still undergoing degradation, but it may raise the suspicion that there may be other blood sources 
that we may need to investigate. But ultimately, it really boils down to how we discuss this with the patient, how is the impact on their symptoms, and whether or not there's any other further requirements to manage this. But sometimes we may just be at a status quo because the bulk of symptomatology has been addressed and the patients make, and the symptoms become more manageable, which is oftentimes the ultimate goal. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about the other end of the spectrum. Uh, fibroid embolization deals with the arteries that feed the uterus. So now we're gonna talk about something called pelvic congestion syndrome, which is really more on the venous side or abnormal veins. Now, pelvic congestion syndrome is another source of chronic pelvic pain, it usually results in multiple office visits, multiple hospitalizations, extensive workups, both from a GI perspective, bladder perspective, neurology, pain management, orthopedics, uh, trying to understand the source of pain and not really finding an answer. It leads to a high level of anxiety, both for the patient and family can lead to depression due to lack of understanding or lack of identification of the source of the pain and the daily uh, management leading to a lot of fear in how women undergo their normal daily activities. And of course, that can also lead to extensive marital relationship tension as well because of the chronic pain that they suffer. Symptoms can be somewhat similar, but there are certain distinctions. The pelvic pressure and pain that they feel tends to be described as a heaviness, not as a cramped, sharp pain, but more like a dull ache. The pain can also radiate into their lower backs, into their hip joints, maybe even up into their calves. Oftentimes they have difficulty with relations and have pain post-intercourse, their bladders are, tend to be hyperreactive, and there's an urgency and a frequency to using the bathroom, voiding. They may suffer from internal or external hemorrhoids. And even visibly on the outside of their body, around the thigh, the legs, even the genital areas, they may notice prominent veins, sort of similar to seeing patients with prominent leg veins and when they have to wear compression stockings to help manage that. So take a picture of that and picture it into the pelvis. The diagnosis of a pelvic congestion syndrome is usually made by excluding all the other common possibilities. And oftentimes it's a careful history and a physical exam Many times patients may end up getting a CAT scan or a pelvic ultrasound or an MRI just to try to establish what the source of pain is. Our preferred preference really is if we are investigating the possibility of pelvic congestion is to look at a CT CAT scan or an MRI of the pelvis with intravenous contrast. So a little bit of an anatomy lesson here. This is a picture of a female pelvis with us looking at the patient directly on. We have here the main vein, which is called the inferior vena cava. And we have veins up here, which is the left renal vein and the right renal vein. Now all blood flow te technically should be heading north. We have veins that drain the uterus, typically. These are the internal pudendal veins at the lower portion of the uterus. And these drain into what's called the internal iliac veins. And we also have gonadal veins or what's called ovarian veins draining from the pelvis as well. The blood flow from the legs are coming from the south. And so everything here is heading up north. Next slide. So just to kind of quickly summarize what I just went over, if we pay attention to the red arrows here, the red arrows depict arterial blood flow. So arteries bring blood flow into the organs. And what happens is the uterus absorbs that blood flow and then sends out blood flow into the veins. And the veins should naturally pass along the ligaments 
the broad ligaments here and ascend up the ovarian vein and join up with the kidney vein on the left side and head up towards the heart. Similarly, on the right side, same thing. It exits out along the ligaments, up, up into the inferior vena cava, and then up towards the heart. All blood flow comes from the feet, aiming upwards, and everything should drain from, north, from south to north. By contrast, if we look at the next slide, what happens is, again, arteries come down and feed the organ. The artery comes in and feeds the left kidney. Normally, the blood flow from the left kidney should be coming out and going up towards the north. But however, because the gonadal vein here or the ovarian vein does not have a valve here, blood flow is now constantly coming down as a pathway of least resistance and enlarges these veins, travels along the broad ligament, and engorges or leads to increased blood flow around the uterus. And at this point, this sits here by gravity. And so there's a delayed blood return happening. And similarly, on the other side, these vessels can also drain out through the lower pudendal system. So imagine if the entire pelvis here now has increased venous pressure, less flow of the blood flow, and that just leads to an engorgement of the uterus and the and the vessels around the ovaries leading to a lot of the symptoms that we went over. Next slide. And so this is a, let's see if this will play. Yes. So here, what we can see is that on this thin A that we are playing, artery blood flow is here. This is blood flow that should be coming out of the kidney and normally going here. We should not see backward blood flow going down the vein here. So this is a really nice depiction on an MRI study that we typically will order called uh, MR venogram, and we will capture a cine loop of the actual blood flow. And if someone has a particularly good example here where we could identify backward blood flow, we can easily make that diagnosis as well. And part of the reason why we say that this is a diagnosis of exclusion is because if I were to look at women with, who have had 100 CAT scans and I can see prominent veins around the uterus, approximately a third of those women may have pelvic pain. So just because you have prominent blood vessels seen on a picture doesn't necessarily mean that you have pain to go with it, which is why we have to exclude everything else before we settle on that diagnosis. Next slide. So this is, uh, these are uh, on, the, on your left-hand side of the screen. We have a picture of a CAT scan on the top and the bottom. To your right are two pictures from an MRI study. When we look at a CAT scan, we can oftentimes pick up the fact that the anatomy may suggest the presence of these veins being enlarged. For example, this is a cross-section of the patient and here's the spine, just to give you reference. The, and this is a kidney here, liver up here. This is the aorta, and this is the inferior vena cava. So these, this here is the left gonadal vein, which is actually about four times the normal size. So just size alone may suggest to us that this is abnormal, and why is it so enlarged? When we look down in the pelvis, these are the hip joints, just for reference and the sacrum is back here. So even here, we can see that there are prominent vessels all surrounding the lower portion of the uterus and the cervix as well. So we can kind of get a sense that there's a prominence of blood vessels here. On the other side, on the right side, we see that there are two pictures from an MR injection of contrast. Again, this is the aorta, which is bringing arterial blood. This is your left kidney, blood flow leaving the kidney which normally should go up and up to the north here. There should be a valve here preventing any blood flow from going down. Now, if this valve is not there, all or partial of that blood flow is going to go south. And you can see that this vein here is quite large, almost as big as one of the main blood vessels in our body. And it travels down into the pelvis, surrounds the uterus and the pelvis, and is, is, is a fairly large serpiginous 
venous structure and then draining out through the pelvic vein. So all of this, as the vein is enlarged and there's low blood, blood flow state, can lead to the chronic pains that they have. And this is something that's ongoing all the time because this pathway is open all the time. Sometimes that may not be true. There may be a valve here that's opening and closing intermittently. And so this may happen on occasion, but it is always a consistent finding. And oftentimes we're gonna look here to investigate. Next slide. So what are the causes? So as we were talking about before, there are valves that should be in position to help prevent some of that blood flow from going backwards. And so there may be a congenital absence of these valves in the veins. And so in those patients, we may see symptoms present very early on once the young patient becomes physiologic and having cycles and there's an increase in blood flow with each cycle. And that promotes the wear and tear of these valves or veins. And so some a women, a woman who's had early onset of her cycles and has a late menopause has gone through decades of this process, physiologic process, and sometimes the valves just give out. And so we may see women who are in their younger uh, presentation in their early 20s. And then we may also see women who are later in life past multiple pregnancies, perhaps in their late 40s into their mid 50s presenting. There is an association with having multiple ovarian cysts as well. And there is a familial connection with first generation females. Next slide. Now there are some other causes as to why this may occur. We talked about absence of valves at particular locations. So for example, an absent valve at the gonadal vein and the renal vein junction right here, or perhaps on the other side, which is on the right ovarian vein junction here. But there are other causes. And there are other two, which is called the nutcracker syndrome, where the kidney vein here is being compressed by the aorta, which is sitting here and one of the branches of the aorta, which feeds our gut. And so if we look down the barrel of that, here is our aorta, here's the superior mesenteric artery, which feeds our gut. The vein is situated here normally. So in a, in a thin patient, or for whatever reason, this artery is being pushed down, this vein becomes obstructed and pinched. So if the blood flow cannot exit here, it's going to naturally want to go down the ovarian vein. And so that leads to that issue. These may end up requiring surgical intervention to undo this compression, or we may put what's called a stent to help open up the vein and relieve this blockage so that all blood flow can travel the way that it's supposed to. The other entity is called Maytherner syndrome. Maytherner syndrome is where similarly the artery blood flow here is compressing on the vein behind it. And behind the vein is our backbone. So it's being compressed. And over time, this leads to a chronic narrowing or sometimes what's called a web. And because it's been pinched off, the blood flow now wants to go inside the vessel here. So on this, go referring you back to the image on your left side, when you have a blockage here, this is per, there's increased blood flow coming up from the leg it's unable to pass through. And so it finds a deviant pathway and it's really basically looking at a normal traffic pattern. When the highways are closed, traffic goes into the side roads. And so here in this case, it would go into your internal iliac system and then potentially communicate with the vessels around the uterus. And so that would be the other pathway. So the treatment here really is to undo the blockage in the, in the vein here, in the iliac vein, and maybe intervening on the pelvic veins. But sometimes we are forced to deal with the other causes, not the primary causes. Next slide. So similar to the uh, uterine fibroid procedure, this is an ambulatory procedure. 
We typically will do this from a right arm approach. So your left arm would have an IV put into it. <coughs> Excuse me. Oftentimes we'll place a Foley catheter in to help relieve the bladder and minimize any dye that accumulates in the bladder so that we can actually see through on x-ray. And again, similarly, we'll use moderate sedation. Uh, and it could be anywhere from a one to two hour procedure. And usually you will be discharged later on into the afternoon or morning, depending on the time of day. So here we have pictures from a procedure. Uh, I'll refer you to the top leftmost corner here. This is coming from what's called a venogram where we are inside the vein. So this is the left kidney vein here. And we are injecting dye. And it basically shows that dye goes down the left gonadal vein or the ovarian vein. And there are no valves to prevent it from coming down. So this is happening all the time. And in the pelvis, there's a whole network of prominent vessels, which really should not be there. Uh, the size of these vessels should be about a fifth in size and in number. And usually the treatment here is going to be is that we end up placing small plugs or coils inside the blood vessels. And we start to close this route down so that blood flow does not want to go backwards. Next slide. This is just another example where someone can have prominent blood vessels in their pelvis. Similarly, where on the, in this particular picture, we see vessels that are traveling on the floor of the pelvis. The bladder is here. And so these are prominent veins that are running along the pelvic floor, also leading to bladder issues, control, pelvic pain. And so the treatment here would be is to plug, put plugs or coils into the dominant vessels here and sealing this off so that these don't fill in. And these are just examples of what the plugs look like. The plugs are permanent. Uh, they don't dissolve or they're not removed. They promote scarring and fibrosis inside the vein. And sometimes we do, we may need to repeat the procedure once or twice. Additionally, because there are other pathways that we need to investigate. So sometimes all the answers are not there, uh, but we begin with what was obvious. Um, similar to a uterine fibroid embolization procedure, we'll send you home with anti-inflammatory regimens. The Foley is removed. We'll follow up in clinic in about a month and we may or may not do an MRI of the pelvis depending on how the symptoms have been addressed. And sometimes what may happen is the patients may experience a significant improvement in their symptoms, and then they kind of stagnate. They don't improve any further, and it raises the question as to whether or not there's additional pathways in the blood flow pattern that need to be investigated or addressed. And those might be super obvious on the first time when we look at their pictures, and other times not so much. So in summary, Interventional radiology is a specialty that offers many minimally invasive alternatives for a whole host of things, but particularly for women, and particularly two entities, fibroid management and chronic pelvic uh, varices or pelvic congestion syndrome. We can play a pretty significant role to help manage it with minimally invasiveness, high degree of satisfaction, functionality, and outcome. Be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bilal, for your extremely informative presentation. If anybody does have questions, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And all questions are anonymous to protect your privacy. Just to confirm, Dr. Bilal, the referring physician would be a gynecologist, correct? Yes. So ironically speaking, um, we've seen referrals for fibroids, uterine fibroids. Most of the time they are referred to us by the uh, local uh, OBGYN uh, physician. Um, sometimes patients will explore these options and discuss it with their GYN. We always like to partner up with the GYN to ensure that the appropriateness of the procedure and that the workup has been thorough 
uh, and also to have good long-term outcome and follow-up. With regards to um, pelvic congestion, uh, these referrals can come from a variety of physicians uh, because the workup is so extensive and many times physicians who are unaware of the diagnosis or may not be familiar with it after all things have been exhausted may refer to evaluate our patients for pelvic congestion. So that particular diagnosis I feel is sort of a, um, a central hub to many specialties leading to the source of pain when, when all else has failed. All right, give it one more minute for any other questions. Also, you're discussing fibroids earlier. Is there a chance that fibroids can become life-threatening or you know detrimental to health? Yes, so some fibroids are the most common fibroid, well, two things that could be detrimental is if you have a uterine fibroid that rapidly grows and rapidly changes. So that may be a situation where one may be concerned that there's a possibility of a, a rare malignancy in that tissue bed. Um, and so that may require a more aggressive treatment with either surgical exploration or a hysterectomy if that is the concern. Um, but the other scenario that could be potentially life-threatening is, is heavy bleeding, where there's extensive blood loss, regular you know, blood loss. And the history of uterine fibroid embolization actually started by treating patients after a C-section or delivery. And this was actually used as a method to slow down blood flow in the uterus to help preserve the uterus and not have to do a hysterectomy. So as a uterus sparing procedure, both in the obstetric literature, it turned into helping to manage on the gynecologic side as well. Okay, great. And you also spoke about recovery time. Exactly how long would it take after a fibroid embolization to get back to normal activity and maybe get back to work? So we usually advise our patients to expect to take off work roughly about seven to 10 days. Um, the, and it really boils down to whether or not it's the puncture site. Sometimes the puncture site may require a little more longer. So a groin puncture may be requiring a little longer, uh, you know, to avoid driving heavy lifting, whereas a wrist puncture, if somebody is right-handed, may not be as intrusive or limiting to them. Uh, the other is pain management. If they're on medications, narcotic medications, we advise them not to be driving or going to work, operating equipment, things like that. Um, but oftentimes by the seventh day or so, most women are able to function enough perhaps to be able to do their daily activities, um, which you know, from a recovery standpoint, uh, I think would ultimately lead them to a quicker return to work. Fantastic. If anybody does have any questions, uh, you can email us at matherhospital at northwell.edu. Again, that's matherhospital at northwell.edu. And we can forward it to Dr. Bilal so he can answer it for you. Once you exit the webinar, you'll be redirected to complete a brief survey. If you could please fill that survey out, your feedback is extremely important to us and it helps us plan our future webinars. If you'd like to view older healthy webinars and content that we've already produced, you could visit us at our website, www.matherhospital.org backslash healthy you. That's the letter U. All right, everybody have a great rest of your day. Thank you.